Thanksgiving is only four days away, and so I thought it would be appropriate for us to uh, hear a psalm of thanksgiving and to read, uh, to, to hear it today, to meditate upon it together. Psalm 100 encapsulate, encapsulates this very well. So if you would listen, for this is God's word to us. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please be seated and let us pray. Father, we are your servants, and we are listening now, so would you speak? Would you open up our ears so that they may hear your glory? We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Uh, One common experience that happens in my household, and I think it's about to happen in the Gunther household as well, is that our son likes to get into things. And oftentimes he will pull something out of a drawer, out of a cabinet, and it just becomes a toy that he can bang or throw. Uh, and we have to, you know, remind him, you know, you know, don't, you know, don't hit hard things on other hard things. You can hit them on soft things, but not hard things. Uh, but it's interesting because Peter will, that, that everything, everything becomes a stick that you can bang or something that needs to be banged. Uh, but whenever you can show him what it actually does in the kitchen, you know, you can use this tool and it gets the orange juice out of an orange, you know, his eyes, they just become, you know, they get so big. Or this goes on the blender, and when we put strawberries and milk and bananas in there, we can make a smoothie. You know, you can just see the scales fall off, and he's amazed. Uh, It's important whenever we use things to know what they're made for, what they're made for. Right? I carry a phone, probably everyone in the room does. Um, You know, it's made out of aluminum and glass, and I've got a plastic case. It would serve as a pretty good doorstop if you needed it to, um, but that's really not what it was made for, right? Uh, it, it could do it, but it's made to do so much more. It's a computer that is in my pocket. Uh, we could use one of these mic cables, and it could be a rope to hold something, but it wouldn't hold for very long because that's not what it was designed to do. It was designed to transmit signals from one place of the building to another so that we can all hear. It's important to know why something was made and to use it in accordance with that purpose. And likewise, as we believe, as Christians, as people who've read the Bible, believe what it says about God, we believe that we are his creation. Namely, that we aren't simply here because of a random colliding of particles that may have happened, you know, recently or long, long, long time ago, but rather God has created us. And maybe he used particle collisions to do that, but rather we exist because of God's unique creative purpose. And one of the ways the Bible describes is the way of folly and not the way of wisdom is to try to figure out, not not to try to figure out, but to try to invent a purpose for ourselves rather than to discover the purpose for which God created us and created the entire world. The poem Invictus, you 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 may never have heard it this way, but you surely know this line, From it, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. It's a declaration of my own autonomy. I get to determine who I am, and no one, no thing, no circumstance can do that for me. I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. The problem is, is that this runs so counter to what the Bible teaches us is God's purpose for our lives. Rather than, I am the captain of my soul, we should say the hymn, which maybe it's familiar to you, maybe it's not, that starts off, Savior, please pilot me. You direct me. You tell me where to go. You tell me, when I ask the question, what is my purpose, it's not simply so that I can fulfill my own desires, but rather that I can fulfill God's. The answer, according to the Bible, for why God has created us, it's in order that, in order that we might serve and worship God. On the first pages of Scripture, Adam is living in the garden, and he's serving there, communing with God. And on the final pages of the Bible, we see the exact same thing. 
we see the people of God surrounding his throne, praising his name, and the Bible ends where it begins, in a garden, with people communing with God, without any hindrance, because of their own sin, because of their location, they are with God, worshiping him forever. And this is our purpose, to know God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And here's what I think we should see today as we read Psalm 100, that to fulfill who God created us to be, we should praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is and what he's done. That's pretty simple, but it's also profound. To fulfill who God created us to be, we should praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is and what he, should, and what he has done. Well, first, let's talk about why we worship God. Why is it important that we do this to begin with? One of the things I love about Psalm 100 uh, is that it is a short, easily memorizable, mem- I'm not saying that right, memorizable psalm. We'll just say it that way. You can memorize it very easily, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and, it, and it gets to the point. It's, it's, it's punchy in a great way. It focuses us on the Lord and it has inspired hymn writers through the centuries. And even today, people write songs and psalms based upon it. But why do we worship God? Uh, I want us to think about the psalms as for just a moment, right? The psalms, that's the Hebrew word for, actually, I don't know if it's Hebrew. Maybe it's Latin. But it means uh, it's a song. Right, and, and there's songs of praise. There's, Psalms are full of praise and lament. One of the reformers said they are anatomy of all the parts of the soul because if you're feeling something, whether that's something really good or you're feeling something really bad, there's a psalm for that, and you can pray that, and God will hear that. Uh, whenever, one of the unique things about the Psalms, the rest of the Bible is God speaking to us, but one of the unique things about the Psalms is that they're words for us to speak back to God. And indeed, one of the main functions of them is to praise God and to worship him in the splendor of holiness. We sing to the Lord because, as verse 3 says, we know him that he is God. Know that the Lord, he is God. We know this fact. Unlike the gods of other religions, this is what Psalm 115 says. He says, you know, they're made out of silver or gold. We might convert that today to maybe made out of plastic or concrete or whatever it might be, or wood. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have noses, but they can't smell. They have, ear. They, uh, have hands, but they, don't have, they can't feel. They have feet, but they can't walk. They don't make a sound in their throat. They don't have the spirit of life within them. They don't send their spirit forth into all creation. But our God is the God who reigns and is the only true God. We know this because he is the one creator. Uh, that's one of the things the Bible says repeatedly throughout is that there is only one God. If there were two creators, then that means there would either be competition leading to chaos. But there's only one God. And he gets to decide what his creation is for because he's the only one. Uh, this meant a lot to King Hezekiah. In the book of Isaiah, you can also read about this in the book of uh, 2 Kings. Um, Assyria was invading the kingdom of Judah. And they were exacting tribute, they were terrorizing cities, and King Hezekiah is quite afraid because it was brutal, it was terrible. And Sennacherib has kind of upped the ante and said, listen, your God isn't going to do anything for you. Look at all the other nations whom we've destroyed. All their gods are gone, and so are the nations. They are now our captives. And look at all the other cities of Judah that we've already conquered. But here's what Hezekiah prays to God in Isaiah chapter 37 Verses 16 to 20. O Lord, O Yahweh of hosts, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands. They have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. This God is above all. All gods, and his name is above every name. And so it's fitting for us to worship this God, to not call upon anyone else for help, but rather to come unto God for aid. 
And we worship him, we worship him rather not simply because we found him, but rather he actually has called us, he has summoned us unto salvation. He summoned us to himself. And if you are a part of God's people, if you are a part of the church, then it means that God has called you to worship him. He's redeemed you. If he saved you from sin, then we know him because of our salvation. We don't know him any other way. It's not simply because we put our heads together and thought of, well, if there was to be a perfect God someplace, what kind of God would that God be like? No, we know him because he saved us. He's given us uh, knowledge of him through redemption. We are dependent upon him. And so as verse 3 says, it is he who made us and we are his. God didn't save us simply so that we could become independent, but rather that we would depend upon him. And we find our purpose in our being whenever we submit to and worship him. And it's through this that we get to know him. And again, oftentimes it seems like God might be far away, you know, and especially as we go through trials, we might ask the question, God, where are you right now? I I know I've talked to some of you who've asked God that very question in the recent weeks. God, where are you right now? But God comes to us. Advent is, count it, one week away, praise God. And what do we celebrate in Advent? That God, in the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, had an Advent, had an arrival, He came to us and indeed is coming again to us. God comes to us and therefore we know him. God is our creator. He is our king. It mentions that we enter into the courts of the Lord. The courts are where the king sits upon his throne. And it tells us also in this psalm that God is eternal. Look at verse 5. It says, for the Lord, for Yahweh is good. His steadfast love endures how long? Forever. And his faithfulness Not just to this generation or to the next, but to all generations. He sits upon his throne now. And the Bible tells us he's flanked with angels on both sides. Cherubim and seraphim sit around his throne, proclaiming his name and his glory day and night. They never cease singing his praises. He dwells. I want you to think about this. The Bible says that God dwells in unapproachable light, yet he approached us and summoned us. And this is why we worship him, because he is our creator and he is our redeemer who purchased us with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We worship him because he is the most beautiful being in the universe. And as Acts 17, verse 28 says, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. This is why we worship this wonderful God. But the next thing we have to discuss is how to do this. How do we worship this wonderful God? Well, there's... Two, there's two key verbs or a couple key verbs here. And I want us to look. Just, this is what the directions are to us in the psalm. Verse 1. Make a joyful noise. In the Hebrew, that literally means shout jubilantly. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to shout today. That might scare you. But we do make a joyful noise. Shout it out loud. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. And then verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. Look at verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord, bless his name. These are the directives given to us. Shout, serve, come, know, enter in, give thanks and bless. And I think we can break this down. I want to kind of put them in simpler categories and actions on the one hand and attitude on the other. Our actions and our attitude based upon the psalm. The first is that we have to come into his presence. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We have to come to God. In Israel, this would have been traveling at least a few miles, but very likely dozens of miles, right, to get to the place where the temple was, where the tabernacle was, wherever the altar and the throne of God was, where the Holy of Holy was, and you could bring your sacrifice to the Lord. But you had to go. You had to travel a physical distance to get there. And again, the court was a beautiful place. The temple, you know, it's part of the passages that sometimes put us to sleep at the end of Exodus with the tabernacle or maybe the beginning of First Kings, where Solomon's building the temple, and you know, it can be the not most exciting part to read, but if you read it in detail, it was a beautiful place. The temple was adorned with tapestries to look like the Garden of Eden. They've got pomegranates that are woven into the fabric and that are, uh, that are welded together to remind us that this is the place where God dwells. It wasn't just a boring room, but it was a beautiful room. And so you would come into the presence of the Father. The Holy of Holies was his throne room. But today, we don't have a central shrine to which we go, right? We don't have to make a pilgrimage to St. Peter's Square in Rome. We don't 
have to go to Jerusalem where it all you know, happened 2,000 years ago. But rather, we believe, as I, we mentioned earlier in, in my prayer in Matthew 18, where Jesus said, where two are more gathered in my name, there I am as well. Right, we gather together as the people of God. The word church in the New Testament, ecclesia, you might have heard it, but it literally means a gathering of people. So the church is the gathered people of God. And we gather, not because we have to go to a f- sacred place, There's this corner is uh, beautiful as this space is, the thing that makes it most holy is the people who inhabit it. And so we gather for the worship of God. So we come into the presence of God. The next thing we do is we sing. And indeed, it is fitting to sing before God, not just because we like music or one particular genre of music or we like to hear instruments, but rather, uh, we, well, we also, we don't sing because we just want to have a concert, right, and hear great things. But we're trying to attenuate our voices in a way befitting the one who made them. Remember, God is our creator. He created these vocal cords, whether they're low and raspy or whether they're high and soft, God created all of our voices. And it's amazing that we can say truths about God in a, mu- in a more beautiful way, in a way that sounds beautiful with melody and with harmony and with unison. And sometimes all together it's singing the same thing, sometimes in different parts, sometimes with different instruments. But we use our voices to praise God. I want, to, I want you to think about some of the truths about God and about your salvation that are buried the deepest within your heart. It's probably lines and words and verses that you heard from hymns or songs growing up in church, right? We believe so much about the grace of God and the priority of God's grace for our salvation, and it's nothing for us to say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, but was blind, but now I see. We can say it or we can sing it. We can sing, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And in those moments when we're doubting, the love of God for us. I mean, we can open our Bibles, and this is not a bad thing to do. Open your Bibles, search it, to find the promises of God where it talks about his love. But we also have that line embedded in our memory, right? One of the, Karl Barth, who was probably the most influential theologian in the 20th century, whenever, you know, he wrote a systematic theology that's literally this wide. But whenever he was about to die, someone said, what is the most, you know, of all, all your study, all your life, you've prayed a lot, you've taught a lot. What's what's the most profound truth you've ever heard? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's a profound truth, and we sing it. We, you know, it's one of the sweetest things as a parent to hear your son just singing that in bed, you know, while he's laying in his crib, or of all the things they could be singing, they're singing, Jesus loves me. The most beautiful instrument that we have as a church, it's not the piano, it's not a guitar, or a keyboard, or the violin, The most beautiful instrument that we have is our voices together, the congregation together, whenever we put our voices together. If you had the chance to go to Bill White's funeral on uh, on Friday, you heard some great congregational singing. I mean, we had a small room with a lot of people. It sounded very powerful. But this is the instrument that God has given us, whether we're we're 10 or whether we're 10,000. We use our voices to praise God. So we come into God's presence, we sing his praises, but also we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God. In verse 4, it says to enter his gates with thanksgiving. And I think that, you know, we wouldn't be wrong to assume that means to enter with the spirit of thanksgiving, especially this week of all weeks when we have thanksgiving on our mind. But that actually meant to enter into the gates with a thanksgiving sacrifice. Turn to Leviticus 7. You can read more about the different sacrifices that you could offer as a thanksgiving sacrifice. But here's, here's what you should know. It's, it's, it says, uh, one of the things that thanksgiving offering is called is also called the peace offering. And unlike an offering where, that you would offer for the forgiveness of your sins, God, I've sinned, I'm confessing my sin to you, I'm slaughtering this animal and giving its life where it should have been my life, Whenever you offer a peace offering, it's not in order to procure peace, but rather it's because peace has already been procured. And so you bring a peace offering to celebrate the peace that you have with God. And the Thanksgiving offering, it wasn't merely, I'm bringing this because I have to give it to God. It was a free will offering given. And it was more akin to a barbecue. 
uh, you can ask Samantha, if I'm going to make really good food for people coming over to celebrate, I'm going to get my smoker out and I'm going to smoke some you know, Boston butt or some uh, a rack of ribs or something like that. I'm going to get the barbecue out and do that. Well, and it serves a lot of people. Bringing a Thanksgiving offering was like having a barbecue. You took your animal to the temple. It was slaughtered and it was killed and, and sacrificed upon the altar, but it was a feast. And, you know, we have a cattle herder in the room. You know there's a lot of beef that comes whenever you take an ox to the slaughter. It feeds a lot of people. And it would feed your family. It would feed the priests who were helping you out. It would feed the poor people who didn't have income, but they could hang out near the temple and get a free meal when we give Thanksgiving. As you did that, you would name specific things to God that you're thankful for. That's something that we often do on Thanksgiving. We sit around the table, right? And I think it would be fitting for us to continue that tradition. Sometimes it's kind of awkward, right? It's like everyone's getting ready to eat. Let's stand around, hold hands, and then, okay. Now everyone say one thing you're thankful for for the year before. It's kind of sprung on you, you know. We, we know it's coming, but it still feels like a trap. I think that we should prepare for that. Hey, listen. Your cranberry sauce needs to be on the table by 2 p.m., but by 1.45, be in the circle, and I want you to have thought about something that you're thankful to God for from this year. You're laughing, but I'm serious. To, to, to think, think, think in advance. You know, what over the past year, through all the joys and all the trials, what can I say to God? God, thank you for this. Thank you for this provision. Thank you for this person. Thank you for this experience that I was able to enjoy. We bring our thanksgiving to God. So we come into his presence, we sing songs of praise, we offer our thanksgiving, right? And today, we, can, we don't offer, we don't offer um, animals to the Lord, but it is befitting sometimes to give, uh, to give a gift financially of some sort. Um, it's, it's not at all ill-fitting when someone says, in honor of this person, or because I'm thankful, I'm going to write an extra check today. And I'm not saying that to drum up support here at the church, although I won't deny that. I mean, if you want to write us a check, we'll take it. But even other, so, other causes, I'm just trying to, the, the, whenever we have Thanksgiving in our heart, it leads us to give out of the overflow, right? Whether that's writing your tithe check every month, whether it's writing a special gift here, or to any other organization that you might support, or even a person who you know is in need. Sometimes that Thanksgiving drummed up in your heart, it overflows in generosity towards others. And that's what I care about more than the dollars right now, is being generous with what God has given us, understanding that it's a gift, and we have the chance to steward it well and to give back to others. The other way, the final action I want us to see and how we can thank the Lord, and how we worship God, is to serve Him, to serve Him. That's what it says in verse 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. The word that's translated there, serve, is sometimes translated worship in other places. And that's true in the Old and New Testament. Those words overlap quite often. And I think it's because there are times in our relationship with the Lord, and this is, I think, our goal. We get to the point where work and worship aren't always two separate things, but rather they're one and the same. I understand that the work that I'm doing, that the service that I'm offering, is my worship. I understand that worship is what God calls me to do. It's a difference, you know, we're called to serve the Lord with gladness. And this gets into the attitude. I said there's actions and there's attitude. Well, the attitude, is, of course, is gladness, joy, understanding that God has given us everything, and this bubbles up joy on our hearts even in the moments when we feel sorrow. But we serve with gladness. It's like, you know, do you show up to church because someone pinched you by the ear and made you come, right? And, and maybe that was us whenever we were younger, right? I mean... I think we probably all lie. That wasn't us at least one Sunday in our lifetime, whenever we'd rather have been doing something else. But thankfully, and in hindsight, we can thank God that our parents made us come. But there's a difference between going out of obligation and going because I want to be there. I always say, you know, if I wasn't at Dalewood on a Sunday, I'm going to be somewhere. Like, you know, if, 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 if the doors of this church were locked or I, you know, y'all said, okay, Ryan, we love you, but bye-bye. Whatever it was, okay, we pray none of that happens. I'll be somewhere on Sunday because I want to worship God. And the same way, we do this gladly. And the best way that we can show that we believe in God is to obey Him. The best show, thing that we can do to show that we love God is to serve Him. Understanding that this is our right spiritual worship, our spiritual service. And we do all these things with gladness, for joy. Well, we talked about why we should worship God. He is the one creator, redeemer. He is the only true God. We talked about 
how to worship God. Now I want us to finish on saying, who should worship God? Who should worship God? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's everyone and us. Everyone and us. Because look at the opening line in the psalm. Psalm 101, Psalm 100 verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. From the beginning of this psalm, he is calling all peoples in all places to worship God. And again, this is consistent with the message we see throughout the whole Bible, that God is here to redeem all the nations and to provide salvation for all of them. But in addition to being a universal call, and we've noticed kind of the universal and particular distinction even in the book of Exodus as we finished that series recently, God has a particular place for his people. So all creation is to make a joyful noise to the Lord, but look at verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God, it is he who made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, there's a way in which God has saved us, that's true, but it's a salvation that's offered to everybody. And so we understand that as the particular people of God, we have a particular role to play but that there is a call for all peoples to join this, right? There's no barrier to someone entering to the people of God other than faith and belief, turning from their self to worship God. It doesn't mean you have to become like me, you have to dress like me, walk like me, talk like me, look like me, but rather that you come unto Jesus. And so who should worship God? Well, this is a call for all of us. It's for everyone. And the, I mentioned at the beginning the way in which we fulfill our purpose for which God created us is to praise and to worship Jesus Christ as our Lord. We know this from Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, where the Apostle Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The way in which we can know God is through his Son, Jesus Christ. The reason that we don't have to bring Thanksgiving offerings and the way that they did in the Old Covenant is because Jesus Christ is our thanksgiving offering. We give thanks in his name. And we can know and we can worship God. Uh, one of the ways in which we know that early Christians were unique and that worshiping Jesus was what they did and that it was controversial is because they did worship him. Right? The fact that these people who were loyal to the one God of Israel and were faithful to him and suddenly now they, there's this guy named Jesus whom they're bowing down to whom they're lifting up. You didn't just worship anyone else. You didn't worship the Lord and Caesar. You didn't worship the Lord and your neighbor. But if you're going to worship Jesus Christ, what does that mean about him? It means that he, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is worthy of our worship because along with the Father and the Spirit, he created all things. And indeed, by him and through him were all things created. And it's because of the Son that we are redeemed because he shed his blood upon the cross for our salvation. And so we know Jesus Christ. This is uh, eternal life, to know the Father in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. That's what Jesus says in John 17. And so as we can c come to a conclusion today and we think about how can we know and rightly worship this God, let Psalm 100, I, I would encourage you to maybe memorize this psalm over this week or over the next month to motivate us to come to the Lord with joy, to offer all of our service and all of our love, all of our praise to him, to come to him in total praise, not leaving anything back, to name the specific things. And maybe you can look back over your calendar in the past year. Look at the appointments that you had, whether that was dinner with a friend or a doctor's appointment or a treatment or a, visit, a vacation to the Smokies, whatever it was, look back on it and and reflect upon that time as a way to thank God. Thank God for his provision. Thank God for his salvation. Thank God for his presence and that he's with us every moment because he has sent his spirit to us. Thank God for one another and for all that he has done. If you would, please bow your heads with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are our good, good Father. 
And as Jesus said, uh, whenever his children come to him, uh, whenever they ask for bread, he doesn't give them a stone. Or whenever they ask for fish, give them a serpent. But rather, you know exactly what we need. You have provided for us. Even though there might have been days where we felt lack, we had want of need, Father, you have never forsaken us, nor abandoned us. And we thank you, Father. God, we thank you that the right mode, the appropriate mode of interacting with you, of uh, loving you, is worship. That this is our mode. You didn't create us merely to be servile beings, to labor all of our days simply to go back to the earth and die, but rather that you've given us the chance to be worshiping beings, that in all that we do, not just on Sundays or on Wednesdays, but every day, we can thank you for who you are and what you've done. God, we thank you for the great salvation which you have offered us in Jesus Christ. As he became a human for our sake, he took on our hurts, he took on our flesh, God, in order that he might die upon the cross for our sins and live again. And Father, I do pray today that if there's anyone in the room or if there's anyone watching online who doesn't know you, who's never committed themselves to you by faith and pledged themselves unto you, repented of their sins, repented of their rebellion and living in ways that are counter to how you have created us, but rather that you would lead us in the way of your creation, Father, that you would restore in us a clean heart, that you would restore in us the joy that we can have of our salvation and to live into that. Father, would you cultivate hearts of thanksgiving in us? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.